Well, hello everyone. Now we're going to start a big section. It's so big I had to divide it up into, into two different lectures. And uh, it's antennas. And in the first lecture on antennas, which is going to be pretty long, it's 70 view graphs long, I'm going to go over the basics of antennas and mechanical scanning antennas. And in the second, uh, we'll be going over hybrid antennas and phased array antennas. But this is going to be the first part which we're going to be going over today. Uh, here, here's the section, the antenna, in, in the bl blocked, our generic block diagram of a radar system. And you, can, you see it's the part which takes the energy, uh, the pulse microwave energy from the transmitter and focuses it out towards the the target and it's uh, bounced back, reflected back towards the antenna which receives that energy. So we're going to focus on the antenna, what makes it up and how they work and how you can tell one type would be used from another. So this just shows you a picture of a mechanical scanning parabolic reflective antenna. Just to fit it in the biggest of pictures. Okay, now what is the function of the antenna and the radar equation? The, it's a means, as, as I said, and this says it very quickly and succinctly, of radiating the radio microwaves or, and receiving them. Or you could have a, two bistat, a bistatic radar that would have one t antenna for re transmitting and one for receiving. But most of the time, the same antenna is used for transmission and receiving. And it's a, a radiated electromagnetic wave consists of electrical mag magnetic fields which jointly satisfy Maxwell's equations. One thing we want to do is direct that microwave energy in the desired direction. We want to maximize that and we want to suppress all other directions, energy going to other directions. And we want to desire therefore to have what is known as the gain of directivity, and I'll go into the differences of those in a moment, we want to design it for optimum gain and or reflectivity and minimum losses of energy. Now as we sh showed earlier in the radar equation lectures, there's two forms of the radar equation, the track radar equation and the search radar equation. And here's the track radar equation. And uh, what we want to do in this lecture, we're going to talk about the gain. And the gain is, um, uh, is in many cases, it's most, most, a simple way of looking at it is 4 pi a over lambda squared, where a is the aperture size. And then the search radar equation is the effective aperture size. So in this, in this lecture, we're going to talk about the gain. And the, and the effective area. And things that can be affect the uh, gain and the uh, um, effective area are the losses in those systems. And we've treated them in the radar equation lecture, but there are losses that are incurred within the antenna. And they have to do with whether we call that quantity which quantifies the directivity um, uh, or the gain, it depends on whether we've included the losses in the, in the antenna or not. To steal my thunder, uh, the directivity is the gain in a zero loss system. So the, the, gain, the gain is you've taken out the 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 losses from the directivity. Directivity is an ideal. And this case, this has really typically come about by there are people that uh, work the side of the antenna design from a theoretical bent. And they look at Maxwell's equations and they design an antenna. And they don't look sometimes at say you've got a slotted waveguide antenna, there are losses in the slotted waveguide. And, and the directivity of that antenna is going to be one number. It won't take into account the loss you'd have. And you have to take out that losses to get the gain of the antenna. 
but we'll go through that in more detail later. Here are some pictures of antennas to show you that they come in all different shapes and sizes. And here we have two. Here we have a parabolic antenna where there's a feed out here. And we have these struts coming out that hold the feed. And it's on a pedestal which has large uh, motors, torque motors, which uh, can move this large antenna. Uh, uh, many tens of meters, many tens of meters around an azimuth and elevation. And here we have a, what seems like a planar flat array. It's an electronic scanning antenna. And this array antenna that we see is a hybrid because this antenna fits in a ray dome and scans around mechanically an azimuth, but frequency scans an elevation. And likewise, this antenna, which uses a different principle for its um, vertical um, scanning, uh, scans mechanically an, an azimuth. And here we see a two-faced phased array where this antenna covers 90 degrees, plus or minus 45 degrees, electronically scanning back and forth. And this side of the face of the whole radar scans another region. Now here we have a mechanical scanning antenna, which you see has two horns. And one horn hits this sort of parabolic, but it's more a shaped antenna to give you a special um, pattern of gain in elevation. And, uh, and it has two beams, one that gives you a lower beam because the um, a feed is located at, at, at this lower uh, uh, height. And the one at the upper height right there will give you a, a gain pattern that's at a higher elevation. Okay. Now let's start, look into antenna if fundamentals. And if you have a good background in Maxwell's equations, as I, su I suggest, you, you should understand most of this stuff pretty much right off the bat. We're going to look at ba uh, basic concepts, the d two different fields regions, near field and far field, explain what they are, the electromagnetic field equations, polarization, antenna directivity and gain, and then the antenna input impedance, and then we're going to take on the subject of mechanical scanning reflector antennas. So we're going to go through these basic concepts one at a time. Now if you think about antennas, man let me tell you, there's a, you can see here there's several score different kinds of antennas, and this is a uh, adapted from a chart in Krauss's antenna book. And it, 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 you can have end fire um, antennas, loops, dipoles, stubs, apertures that can be either reflectors, lenses, or horns, and slotted, as I mentioned before, slotted apertures. And these can all be broken down. Dipoles can be broken down to arrays of dipoles. Uh, the... Uh, uh, one antenna that you've already seen that was an array of dipoles was the chain home system radar. It was an array of dipoles, folded dipoles, curtains. Then you see this W8JKs. Well, this is actually an amateur radio operator's uh, license number, and uh, and he invented a certain uh, array, a certain array, and it's the the array is named after his call sign. Uh, like I happen to be an amateur radio operator, and my my call from the I got from the FCC is WW1V, and like in Boston, a radio station is WBZ. Well, if you're a licensed amateur radio operator, which you have to be to transmit, uh, you get one of these things when you uh, go through the process of getting your your FCC license. So there's a whole series of different kinds of antennas. How are we going to go through them all? Well, see, let's tur turns out it's pretty easy because radars only use certain types of 
of uh, antennas, aperture slots, and uh, dipoles, pretty much. They, this covers, but with a well used, there, that there may be certain antennas that are, that are spiral apertures, but for the most part, most antennas that you'll see in uh, radars will fall into this, the categories that are colored here. Now, how do we generate electromagnetic fields and calculate them? The way electromagnetic fields are radiated is by the acceleration of a charge or by a time-varying current. And the acceleration is caused by external forces. They can be transient and that we send the pulse of energy down a line. Our time harmonic sources, an oscillating charge. Um, excuse me, we have a little error. There should be little parentheses here. A time oscillating charge, which we pulse on and off. And that time harmonic, frequ the frequency of the the time harmonic source will be the frequency that will be trans of the transmitted pulse of energy. And an electromagnetic wave is calculated by integrating the source current of the antenna or the uh, induced currents on the target. As you saw when we looked at induced currents that um, a plane wave hitting a target would would cause. So uh, there's a backscattered electromagnetic wave from the in induced currents on the target or on the aperture or the, or the receiving antenna. Okay, now electric currents on conductors are magnetic currents on apertures. These give transverse electric fields. And these source currents can be modeled and calculated using basically the same techniques that we talked about two examples of the method of moments and the finite difference time domain methods that we use to calculate cross-section. Those same methods can be used to calculate the electromagnetic fields from the source, either uh, an electric current of, uh, of, on a dipole or um, an electric, a magnetic, an electric field distribution to be a magnetic current and an aperture. Now we'll go. Just want to mention briefly uh, the use of the term phaser. Uh, electrical engineers are taught early on uh, in their circuit theory uh, to think of complex uh, voltages and fields and stuff like that as as a phaser, where they take out the time harmonic variation, and they use in a lot of arguments uh, this this phaser notation. Uh, train, I got all my training up through my PhD in physics and I never heard of a phasers till I talked to electrical engineers and we were trying to, to describe, uh, understand each other. So it's a little bit different. But what it, uh, 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 if we have an instantaneous electric field, E, which is the fields of vector, of course, and it's a function of, say, in a Cartesian coordinate system, X, Y, and Z, and T, if we, the real part of that, if we take the real part of that instantaneous electric field and we divide it up into a phasor portion and the time varying, harmonic time varying portion of the field, the e to the j omega t, this part with, with the twiddle over it is what the phaser is defined as. So it's the amplitude of the vector, its angle in complex space, which is this e to the j alpha. And instantaneous harmonic field is this, and this would be the magnitude, and cosine omega t plus alpha, then the real part would be this. And then and this would be the real part of it. And any time variation can be expressed as a superposition of harmonic solutions by Fourier analysis. So what that says is any time variation of a field you can express as a, a linear combination of these quantities. Okay, now the near field and the, the far field. 
I talked to you earlier about the optical region and the um, and the Rayleigh region. Uh, when we when we talk about regions of radiation, we've got regions that are right near the antenna, and then we've got regions where you're very far out in space, and very far out in space. It, it, you have in the far field it's known as you have a plane wave and in the near field the antenna um, transmits a spherical wave and coming on, out of this antenna and from a transmitter here the energy comes down a transmission line and say out uh, a horn and the inside the electric field vectors go back and forth and alternately and then as they escape they transmit into um, waves that are spherical in the near field and in the far field they're plane waves. Now that's a visualization. Now what I'd like to do is let you know numerically what the, the fields are. The, fra the far field, it's also known as the Fraunhofer region, uh, that field, uh, is for distances from the source greater than twice the aperture size of the antenna squared divided by lambda. And all power is radiated out. The radiated wave is a plane wave. And the far field electromagnetic wave properties that a radar would deal with way out in space are the polarization, the antenna gain or directivity, if we don't have the losses put in yet, the uh, antenna pattern, and the target radar cross section. They're all quantities that we deal with in the far field. In the near field, the reactive near field, it, there's, the energy is stored in the vicinity of the antenna, right in here. And there are near-field antenna issues that one wants to be aware of. The input impedance that the system has, the antenna has, and the mutual coupling that the, that if you if it's, say we had a set of dipoles, the coupling that the dipoles would have with each other. Those are issues that have to be taken into account in calculating here the spherical near field region. Okay? Now, once we're out in the far field, we're generating a plane wave, and the k vector, which is the propagation vector, is out going out radially. And in this uh, notation, we have the electric field uh, going vertically upward. And of course, your E cross H gives you the direction of propagation, so H would be out of the view graph, and that's the orientation of the electric field vector. Now, mathematically, um, this far field, a spherical wave, can be approximated in the far field by a plane wave. There's no radial components in, in the far field, and the electric and magnetic fields are given by these equations. Notice that the far field uh, falls off, the, the electric and magnetic fields fall off as e to the a minus j kr over r, and that the electric field is related to the magnetic field by 1 over this um, intrinsic impedance of free space which is just the square root of uh, mu zero over epsilon zero. Turns out this is 377 ohms. And of course, k, as I mentioned earlier, is the wave propagation constant of the wave number, and it's 2 pi over lambda. And here's what that electric field uh, looks like. Where, and we'll go a little bit We're here. In blue, we would have the electric field, and this would be for a a single frequency sinusoidal wave and perpendicular to it and the x-plane is the magnetic field and this wave is propagating in the y direction. 